Hi there, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the webinar Seed Quality Assurance. Um, very happy you could be here. Um, this is the second webinar of the second day of our Good Seeds mini conference, the fourth and final webinar of our series. Um, for those of you who have joined us for several of these webinars already, thank you so much for your time and attention. And those of you uh, who are new to the series, welcome for the first time. I'm sure you're really going to enjoy this event. This webinar is hosted by the Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security in the Atlantic region. My name is Steph Hughes and I'm the Regional Program Manager for the Bauta Initiative in the Four Atlantic Provinces. Um, it's possible that we've never been acquainted, in which case I would invite you to just jot down the information on your screen or give it a, a screenshot. Um, most of my job is talking to people about seeds on their farm and trying to support the work that they do with seed saving. Um, so if you're looking for information about seeds and, and on-farm seed saving, I would love uh, it if you reached out to me. I'm going to begin our time together with a little bit of a land acknowledgement that's relevant to the place that I'm calling in from. Um, we're all calling in from many different regions and so um, if you care to kind of participate in this process with me, I would invite you to, to put into the chat box where you're calling in from. And if you know that place, your community by its Indigenous name or its treaty number, then please share that with us as well. Um, the map on your screen right now is a great resource. The website is there as well. If you don't know the Indigenous history of the land that you're on, um, I'd really recommend you check it out. It's a really good starting place uh, for education about uh, land in Canada. So I'm joining our call today from Mi'kma'k, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, I've spent most of my life in the Maritimes and only in the last uh, few years have I learned that I, I live on Mi'kma'k, which is a big stretch of land that encompasses many communities in the Maritimes, including most of modern day New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI and parts of Newfoundland are all in Mi'kma'k. Um, so this is the, the kind of fourth land acknowledgement I've done in two days as part of this series. Um, I really see them as a starting place uh, for considering the, the history of the land that we're on and the present moment of being on this land and how we came to be on this land and what it, what it, what it means. Um, in Canada and on Turtle Island, Indigenous land is where seed is grown. And so I think that gives us an extra special responsibility to think about the impacts of our seed work uh, in terms of Indigenous land, Indigenous people, and Indigenous food and seed ways. Um, and we've had some very uh, thoughtful uh, comments and insights from presenters over the last two days who are actively thinking about this and reflecting on it, even as we talk about seed in a particular way of being produced or sold or owned. Um, and so I'm really grateful for, for the shares that we've had so far. In the spirit of a land acknowledgement being just a beginning point for consideration of Indigenous land, I wanted to share um, uh, a recent project with you all. I think that you'll find this interesting. Uh, recently, Sovereign Seeds launched its support of something called the COVID-19 Indigenous Seed Crisis Response Circle. Uh, so the Seed Crisis Response Circle is a collective of Indigenous seed keepers growing out Indigenous seed varieties to increase their supply and then redistributing that seed to Indigenous individuals and initiatives who need access to their seeds for both food and seed saving. Uh, so we've discussed over the course of this webinar series a little bit the rush on seeds that happened with COVID-19. And while that was really exciting for many of us to see that interest sparked um, in communities where seed uh, supplies were precarious, they're much more precarious now um, because of that. So uh, the seed crisis response circle is a way of addressing that threat and also uh, at the same time building collective capacity. Uh, so this is not a seed change fundraiser, uh, but it's something that we're supporting in an effort towards solidarity and food justice. This is a decolonially driven Indigenous led seed sovereignty initiative. They are partway towards their goal of raising $35,000. And if you're able, uh, making a contribution to this fundraiser could be a very powerful way of supporting seed sovereignty uh, for Indigenous people. There are other ways that you can amplify this work as well. Um, if you're interested in communicating about it on your social media networks, 
um, or by writing an email to some friends that you think would be interested, I think that would be wonderful. I would encourage you to get in touch with me first. The leadership of the project has shared some language with Seed Change staff so that as we communicate about this project, this fundraiser, uh, we can be really respectful of its Indigenous leadership and the messages that they want to be disseminating about it. Um, and thanks in advance for giving that some thought. Um, <clears throat> today, we welcome our four final speakers in the series, um, each of whom brings an incredible depth of knowledge to this topic from working with seeds on their farms, in the farm office, on the seed warehouse floor. Um, I sent all of their bios to you previously, and so I'll keep this short and just briefly say hello and welcome to Mel Sylvester from the BC Eco Seed Co-op and University of British Columbia Farm. Yvonne Montpellier, who spent over a decade working at the Fedco Seeds Warehouse, and Matthew Goldfarb, who is co-founder of Fruition Seeds in New York State. Heron Breen is also joining us from Maine, where he works as part of the Fedco Seeds team and also has his own operation, Fruits of Our Labor Farm. Uh, Heron and I have been collaborating closely on this webinar series. We're good friends now, having been in this for two days and four webinars. Uh, and I'm really happy to have his help facilitating uh, today's session. He'll be your main facilitator. Um, so thanks so much for being here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Heron. Thank you so much, Steph. And I really want to just say so many, so much uh, gratefulness for Steph and all of uh, her work over the last couple of months. Uh, it's been a, like two or three, two months of intense collaboration that Steph's brought us all together. And also a, a huge thanks to our presenters today who are joining from different time zones who are taking time off of work, time away from the things that are pressing in both agriculture and their jobs. Um, well, I really hope that we can all do this again soon in person. And that's the whole hope of this. Meanwhile, we're trying to learn from each other in the midst of uh, COVID-19. So we're doing the best we can. And uh, okay, well, uh, Steph, if you want to pop up some slides, I'm gonna give a little framework for today's discussion. And then we're gonna hand this off to uh, Mel, who's gonna really go into some good detail about the, re the regulations and standards for uh, selling uh, seeds in Canada. So uh, as Steph said, uh, I work both at Fedco and have my own farm the other uh, 40 hours a week. So, you know, uh, when it's daylight, you know where I am. It's one of these two places. Um, so next slide, Steph. Uh, okay, so this, this packet is probably, Yvonne has seen these. Uh, this, this turns out to be probably the most valuable thing that Fedco owns, they don't know it. Um, but these are packets uh, that are about 100 years old. Um, this is from the A.L. Fisher uh, seed company in Brooksville, uh, Brookville, Ontario. This is a variety of corn called the Cori. Uh, this was the first named variety of white sweet corn, uh, open pollinated sweet corn. And this was the standard and selections from this variety of sweet corn are basically the basis of not only all white sweet corn, but basically all hybrid white sweet corn as well. Uh, I have never seen this variety in any germplasm collection, although I've read about it multiple times, um, this there is actual seed in this packet that is over 100 years old. Um, so I just want to ask these questions about seed packets. When we start here, uh, what I learned after many years of working in the seed trade is that the seed trade is both a gift giving business and an investment business. I am lucky enough to both work with seed, but also I love uh, purchasing seed from all my friends who have seed companies. And by goodness, when I get a package in the mail or more than one, I am so happy. And uh, it's often really important for those of us who work in seed to realize that those of us who are, those folks who are trying to get seed from us are doing this as a gift to themselves or to their family, to both, uh, basically support themselves, but also an investment in the next year's food supply. Now, of course, if it's a farmer, they're investing money with the intention of a capital return. Uh, next slide. This is another seed packet. 
And as you see, things haven't changed much. There's prices, there's names. Anyone who's selling seed, please take a look at that uh, cabbage packet there with the cabbage going both ways. I love that. And when I saw that, I said, wow, why aren't we doing that? Um, but you can also see that there's, you know, your normal description of the variety on the other other packet. This is the standard things that we expect: good description, good labeling, uh, clarity, and a hundred-year-old packet that hasn't fallen apart. Something that uh, some of us in the seed trade could learn from. Next, next slide. Again, different packages. Interesting. Cardboard seed. That's a little cardboard box that sweet corn used to come in. And this is a Danvers onion packet. Uh, Danvers is onion from Massachusetts, an old heirloom that's basically one of the basis of all yellow storage onions. In fact, I know a hybrid onion breeder right now who this is like the primary parent line that he is using. Next slide. Uh, this is a little poster that we made at Fedco. Uh, after many years of being asked by our customers, what does all this junk on your packet mean? But usually from your customers, if they're asking that, it means you're not being clear enough. So that's what that means. Your customers are telling you, you need to, you need to have a better packet. But we keep things simple. Uh, and every piece of information on this packet is uh, I, both is supposed to tell the customer something, but at the same time is also a reflection of the a business. Um, that an individual or a group of, or some individuals have come together to run. Now there's the standard stuff like dates to maturity, the size of the packet, things like that. But let's back up a little bit. First of all, if it's got a germination on it, it means that somebody in that business has spent the time to learn and understand and apply a whole bunch of knowledge to figure out whether this seed is good or at the very minimum have understood the regulations that they need to spend, send that seed away. That right there is a first level quality assurance, germination. Then there's this packed for a year. Goodness, it means that there's a whole bunch of people packing seeds somewhere, or at least one person packing seeds somewhere. And it means that they're keeping track of things by year. So obviously it means they've got some kind of database. It means someone's invested in that. That's a different stage of a business. Then you've got the price. It means that someone's figured out the profit margin with their seeds, or at least you hope they are because you hope they'll be in business next year so you can buy their good seeds again. So that's a whole nother part of the business where someone's trying to figure out how do I stay in business and how do I make this seed affordable and how do I scale the prices across all the different sizes and make it attractive and be competitive. These are all parts of a business. Then there's the item number. Goodness, this is a whole way that we all track the seeds that we sell internally and how we communicate in our order order process. Then there's the size code. Oh, you mean there's more than one size? This means that someone has gotten to the point where they have a business where they're selling more than one size packet. That usually means that they're trying to serve multiple growers or multiple types of customers, which is a whole nother realm of things. Then there's this days of maturity. That means that these folks are claiming to you that they, they know something about this variety that they're the experts about this seed. So you can see that the information in the packet is actually both a reflection of the business as well as the sort of social context of what we reflect when we think seed. And Steph is, is uh, turning down the heat. Next slide. Uh, here's some interesting packets. Um, these are old packets, uh, and one of them basically says, I think the uh, lettering is a little unclear. I apologize for that. But basically, the F.I. Webster packet says to the effect, we're basically just saying this, this seed is good, but we're not making any guarantees. So if, basically, give it back to us if you're not willing to accept the fact that you're just like risking all your, all your money for a seed that may no, may no good, <laughs> which, which I love. <laughs> So these are these other assurances that we basically often are telling each other that we're not going to give each other, we're either going to give your money back or we're not going to give your money back or we're not liable for anything. Next slide. And this is, of course, something that I think many of us neglect, grown by. This is a seed company that's growing the seed in the old days. And I think many of us neglect to um, communicate this. When we looked at that slide at the very beginning, which is the sweet corn, um, what's interesting about that is when I look at that sweet corn quarry seed, I say, I wonder who grew this? 
I wonder who packed this. I wonder who printed this envelope. I wonder who boxed this up. I wonder who or how this was paid. I wonder who bought this. And I think we one of the things we uh, should think about in the seed trade, the small scale seed trade that we have the option to do is to not other ourselves from the process. When somebody sees a packet full of seed, all they're seeing is the seed. Many people have seen lettuce. Fewer people, if very few people, have actually tried to get lettuce seed off of lettuce plants. Many people have never even seen lettuce go all the way to flower, let alone all the other vegetables that we produce seed of. So I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by not incorporating the level of trust and also ourselves in that cycle of trust. So quality assurance is basically trust. Selling seeds is a trust business. And since we cannot see each other and all we have are these packets that reflect that, basically we're using things called quality assurance to do those things. And all these different guidelines, whether it's uh, province or state or government, federal, large government, um, these are all set up to basically head off bad quality seed. Next slide. So what is good seed? Everyone's got a different definition and everyone in this room will, and, and in this presentation will have different definitions of what it means to them. In the seed trade, these are some of those definitions and we'll be touching on some of those today. A couple of the things we don't often think about is the one that good seed is, a, is seed of a good variety that is consistently available year after year in useful quantities. Basically, if I'm selling seed and I only have enough every so often, every five years to try to sell something, it's not going to be good seed, meaning that people cannot depend on it for their gardens or their farms. So that is some of this production element of becoming a good production, a uh, good producer, a good steward, and also making sure that your seed catalog has a consistent array of high quality seed. But all these other things are things that we're going to be talking about today. Next slide. Next slide, yep. Um, and this is just one last thing. I'm just circling back to this. this we, I looked at this, we looked at this the first day yesterday morning. Uh, this is 1910, and this is just before we transition to Mel. Uh, this is a market grower um, talking about basically this person should be getting royalties from folks like Elliot Coleman and everyone else. This book, Success in Market Gardening, is probably the most detailed book about growing vegetables I've ever read. Um, this person says about seeds, perhaps we might truthfully say that the most important of all points in gardening is the right selection of seeds. For without good seed, the care and expense devoted to selecting and fitting the land or procuring and using implements, fertilizer, etc., is bestowed in vain. By good seed, we not only mean such as will germinate properly, but such as is true to name and of the very best selected strains. It is proper in this connection to say that no one need expect to get such seed as we have spoken at at such absurdly low prices as much cheap stuff is sold for. Better to pay twice the market price for an article that is first class in every respect than have poor trash, even if it be had as a gift. So this is the transition point from where we say, people ask me, what is the difference between being a seed saver and selling seed? If I hand you a small packet of seeds and say, try this, it's something I save seed of, you're not betting your farm. But if you buy seed from me, you are, you are making an investment and you're trusting the product that I am delivering to help fulfill that investment. So when that's how I frame the difference between being a seed saver and a seed seller. Okay, with that, I'd love to hand this off to Mel. Uh, Mel is basically our, our source, well, our well of knowledge today about all the different uh, experiences that they've had with the Canadian seed regs. Um, I'm an interloper, I'm from the States, I know nothing. Uh, thank you, Mel, for bringing us on board and going through these details with us. Thank you, Aaron, that was really inspiring. There's a lot of things in there. I wish, that's what I miss from uh, this whole COVID and the webinar thing. I wish we could just jump right into like you know conversation about those those topics. But you know, one day we'll be back. 
we'll be back in one room and we'll all be able to, to chat with each other in an appropriate distance. Humans are meant to interact with each other. <laughs> uh, but on that note, uh, other topic. Um, so yeah, I was asked today, well, thank you first for organizing this webinar, the organizer. I'm happy to be here and happy to connect with other seed folks, uh, something I haven't done in the last year or so. Uh, so yeah, I'm super happy to join today. And I'll be talking to you about the seed regulations. Uh, not necessarily because I love regulation. For some reason, I don't know why I'm the one presenting media on regulation, because I'm not a huge fan. But I think one thing that I acknowledge is like, even if you don't like them, you do need to know them, <laughs> just so that you know how to navigate um, around them too. Um, so I am not, by all means, I am not an expert, I think, on those regulations. Uh, but I have looked into them and researched them enough that I can present to you today and hopefully give you the tools that if you have any further questions, uh, you can dig a little bit more yourself. So I'll just do a quick overview here, basically what you, I think you need to know. So yeah, let's move forward. Like and there's the slides are a little bit wordy. I may not cover everything that you'll see in the slides. I just wanted them to be there for you to, to go back. We're limited in time and it's a big topic. So I thought I would leave some of the information there, but uh, not necessarily tackled it. So first thing you need to know about seed regulation in Canada is, is actually overseen by the CFIA. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with that, it's the Canadian Food uh, Inspection Agency, I believe. Um, so they are, yeah, they are responsible to oversee everything that happened around the seed regulation and the seed act. Um, there's a few related documents that are uh, part of those big package of seed regulation in Canada. Uh, the four main ones are here. Um, if you are you know, very bored this winter and you want to look through extremely boring document, I invite you to read them in details. Uh, but that's what I'm here today. I want to basically summarize them to you so you don't have to do that. Uh, most of the information you probably will need as a actual growers, it's probably in the seed regulation. Uh, seed Act just gonna lay the, um, the scene. And uh, in terms of the Kenyan methods and procedure for testing seeds, you may wanna also peek at that. There's a lot of information out there that's not necessarily uh, pertinent to vegetable growers. It's a lot about grain growers because here in Canada, like, let's be honest, most of our seed system is around the grains uh, that are grown in the prairie. So a lot of the seed act and seed regulations are also uh, to be able to control that aspect of the Canadian um, seed world and not necessarily for vegetable, but they haven't forgot about us. There is things for vegetables in it. Um, and obviously there is a Plants Breeders Act and Plants Breeders Rice Regulations that if you're a plant breeder or going into that world, please yeah, be aware of that um, document. Uh, so the seed act and seed regulation. So basically the way it's laid out, um, it's, it's kind of scary when you start reading it because you're like, oh my God, we can't do anything about without permission here in Canada. Uh, but what it is nice, um, so I can let you basically uh, read this later, but what's nice is that when you keep reading, you basically find out that vegetables fall under the exception, which is the best news of the day here that we're having. <laughs> So we can basically in Canada sell vegetables um, under uh, or without grading it. Um, we'll talk about grading a little bit later on here uh, or without confirming with any standard for minimum percentage of germination. Uh, should you be going ahead and selling seed that doesn't conform? That is an ethical question more than anything else, I think. Uh, but basically what the seed regulation is telling you is that like, if you're not gonna grade it, if you're not gonna go and call your seeds number one, Canada number one, or uh, a license, other license name, then you're following basically, you don't have to follow all the same rules. Uh, but if you're gonna sell your seeds, there is still rules to be followed. So hopefully that will clarify as we're moving forward here. So I'll just move to the next slide here. Um, although you're not, uh, you don't have to follow any, um, regulation in terms of germination or minimum germination rate, you are though, you, you have to follow the regulation around minimum wheat seeds. So you're not exempt of that. Um, and all of those, like you can see here, I'm referring to you to a table and all that. You, you do need to go in the seed act, or I mean, sorry, in the seed regulation and the procedure. And that's where those tables are. And by 
um, specific crops, they will tell you what is the allowable, allowable um, percentage of weed seeds or unwanted seeds that you're allowed to have in a seed lot. Uh, so this is something you have to do. Um, thankfully, or I feel from my from my personal experience, a lot of time uh, in a small scale see, uh, vegetable growers, we don't deal with much. Uh, weed seeds, when uh, the bigger you get, the more mechanized you get, the more the weed um, seeds become an issue. And there's also specific seeds that it's always an issue if you have very small seeds that grow low to the ground, depending on your methods, that could be an issue. But it's usually not one thing that I haven't been dealing personally with that much. Um, but yeah, just so you know, that is something you are required to pay attention to and uh, take records of if you're going to sell seeds, obviously. So this is all, again, in the context of you're selling your seeds. Um, let's move on. So labeling is probably um, the main aspect that we should all be aware of, uh, that is, and that we all have to follow by the rules if you're going to be selling seed in Canada. So one thing that needs to be on your packets, uh, either it's a box or a packet, so whatever you're sending your seeds in, your name and address needs to be on it. Um, pretty simple usually, but the address is often missing. Um, we'll see some example a little bit at the end and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, but you also need the name uh, of the kind of species or the variety. So that's kind of a no brainer. If you're gonna sell seed, you're gonna have to tell someone who's, what's in the packets. That's usually something that most people will succeed at doing <laughs> pretty easily. Um, and then moving forward here. Um, so if you have graded your seeds, you are allowed to put on the packets and you should probably put it on packets because it's an expensive um, step of selling seeds if you're gonna go all the way to grading it. Um, and if you're not grading it or if you're grading it too, uh, if this, but if the seed is not sold on the basis of a grade, uh, you do still have to declare um, information about germination. It's not like because you're not grading it, you can just go off record and just setting seed without telling anything to anybody. So what's required basically under the regulation is you need to put in the year of your germination test that you're doing. And you also, you have two choices then. You either, you have to declare the actual germination that you've, the result that you got from your germination for the year of cells, or you could also go with a minimum germination that you can guarantee. So if you want, if it's easier for you for not reprinting your packets uh, every year for that same crop, you could be like, okay, well, for my arugula, I like to have my minimum set at 85%. I'll have that standard packets uh, pre-printed and I'll just put 85% minimum germination on it. So basically what um, you're telling your customers is that like everything that's in there will be above 85. But if there's a year you have a really good germination 95, well, it's your loss, you will not be able to claim it, but that's, that could be an approach. But what we're saying here is that you do have to report germination. So grading or not grading, the germination needs to be reported. Um, so the use of variety name here, uh, that's just a reminder in terms of like variety. So yes, you do have to declare the variety that's on it. Um, so what else did I say here? Sorry, I'm, I'm re refreshing myself about my slides at the same time as I go here. Um, but I guess one thing I want to mention in terms of variety names um, is something and I've seen that unfortunately is just, just be careful like I have unfortunately seen people that saves a seed and they either in some cases they just forgot um, what originally it was called and they just rename it. It's not, I mean it, it's debatable, <laughs> but like you kind of have to, if, it, if it's a known variety it needs to follow uh, the name and in Canada I believe there is actually regulation around that that you're not necessarily allowed to sell something that hasn't been recognized as a variety. Um, it's probably more in the grain world again that will be um, looked at uh, but I think in terms of like as an in an ethical way you should always be declaring the true variety name if it is known. Um, I'll move forward here. So grading, I don't want to spend too much time about grading, although it is a very interesting topic and there's multiple layers of grading that exist in Canada. And I know in the US it's the same thing too. 
most of the time what we're uh, familiar with of vegetable growers is the Canada number one here in Canada. That's what most of the biggest um, distribution company of seeds have been adapting, uh, adopting, sorry. Uh, so we're talking William Dam, I think, West Coast Seeds for sure. Uh, so they will often say like, well, our germination and our quality basically is Canada number one, which means basically is that if you go back to those tables that tells you, okay, for chard, we're looking at like a minimum uh, or maximum amount of wheat seed for that much. And if you want to be grading your seeds as Canada number one, this is your minimum germination it has to be. Um, to be doing so with grading, it will require a little bit more, I would say a bit more record keeping, but that's when there's a bit of a gray area in the way that the seed act is laid. They make it very clear that if you're gonna grade it, this is what you have to do. They don't make it so clear that if you're not grading, what is actually the record keeping you have to keep? And they make it sound almost that it's the same, uh, but this is where um, I think we would need an expert from CFIA to uh, translate <laughs> their document for us. Um, but I, I believe like, not I believe, but for sure, if you're going to um, claim a number one or a number two or a certified seeds, you would definitely will have to um, submit those records to the CFIA for them to verify. Or in some case, I think it's them doing inspection on folks that are uh, claiming those status. So I won't spend too much more time on that. There is a lot, again, in terms of like what certified number one means compared to register, compared to number one, compared to number two. It's usually in the, it, it stands in the quality of the seeds and the way it was grown. Um, but moving forward, so yeah, testing for grading. I, I've touched on that a little bit already. Um, this is, um, yeah, one thing that is saved very clearly in the seed regulation. And if you have to use a recognized standard methods when you are uh, doing germination testing here in Canada. That's why I find it very funny because they keep referring to the recognized standard methods. And there is basically, they don't tell you what are those <laughs> for first thing. And from what I can understand from the the regulations, they would only recognize the Canadian one, the one that's like issued basically by the government, with the Canadian methods and procedure for testing seeds. Um, so that's that's the part I found a little bit funny in their writing, but I guess they left a window open or a door open that if someone was to come up with another uh, standard method that they were happy with, they would recognize it. Or perhaps they would accept one from the states in that case. If the seed was to be imported and regraded here, perhaps they will recognize the one from the US or from Europe as a recognized standard method. So it's probably what more what they mean by it. Um, but that's for grading. So seed testing overall, again, it's repeating the same thing here, just uh, more um, uh, basically more details about how that goes about the testing. You could be using a lab. Obviously, this is very expensive. Most seed companies, if you're not at a certain stage, uh, lab, yeah, can become very costly. Although I know some that will do a hybrid models that some seeds they will send to lab, some seeds they'll do in-house, depending on how complex they are and their capacity to do it right in-house. Um, and now that's the reporting uh, piece of it. Uh, that I wanted to, to talk about a little bit. So it is unclear, like I said, the way it's written. If you are not going to claim any grade on your packaging, um, what is the actual reporting that you need to keep? What are those records that you need to keep on hand? Um, and because I feel in this case, because the government is not telling us, and also because a small seed producer uh, and I would assume here small, and when I say small, it's from anybody that sells seeds, but are not at the stage of being like a distributors. And um, uh, it's, it's hard to define <laughs> like that small, medium, large, and where we're doing the cutoff here, but I would assume a fairly small province base, maybe a little bit beyond uh, that grew mainly their own seeds or will buy seeds from like um, neighboring farmers or in their province. So basically what I'm getting at here is that I think there is a level of reporting 
um, and a level of records that we should all be keeping. If you're certified organic to start with, you'll have to be keeping some records no matter what. But in terms of germination testing and all that, I think most good companies that do um, a good, good job at doing germination testing, you do want records in a way for yourself, even if nobody ever asks you at all anything about germination, you would still want to know how your seed performed the previous year. And then you test it again. It's like, well, what was the germination rate of one year? And on the other end of that, um, what about the customers? Like how much transparency do we have, do we want to have for customers? I think that the component of it about putting as much information as possible in the packets and the minimum is set by the government or CFIA. Uh, but beyond that, you may want to have even more records to be able to trace back for yourself uh, what happened with that seed if there is an issue. So would the government ever come knocking at our door as vegetable growers that have a small scale seed company? I highly doubt it, but I do not want to state that it will never happen because I don't want you to swear at me if it does. Um, as far as I know, it just has never happened. <laughs> but, you know, we never thought we would live in a pandemic and here we are. So, I mean, what well, just won't state that it will never happen right now. Um, so the level of reporting, if you want to really play by the book, it's all laid out and again in the regulation. Um, you really need to keep track, for example, of how you did it, not just the results of it, but how you did it, the temperature, um, at which interval, the days that you've actually checked your germination. Um, yeah, and like what's, what was the medium you used and how it was done. So all that needs to be recorded and need to be accessible for inspection. Uh, and that's how I'm interpreting basically in the regulation right now. Um, but yeah, I think that's it's um, sometimes it could be, I feel like a lot for small seed companies, but I think a lot of the components that are required in those reports are things that you want to know as a seed grower. So you want to be able to, if it worked really well one year, you want to be able to repeat it the following year. So you want to have those notes. And I don't know if you're all like me, but like, I think I will remember something 99% chance I won't remember the following year. So may as well write it down and have it well organized enough that someone else can look at it too. Um, so just, yeah, I think here I have a little summary. Um, just summarizing here, um, what do you need on the seed packets in Canada? You need your name and address, you need the variety name, and you need the year of the germination and, and the germination that it was done or the minimum germination as we talked about. You need to meet the minimum or the maximum amount of weed seeds in your packets. And then your testing needs to be done on the recognized methods. And you need to, yeah, do, the, there's also a component, actually, I forgot to mention about sampling. When you're sampling for germination, there's a way to do it. And I'm hoping either Yvonne or someone else may cover that briefly about um, how to do a proper sampling. And that is also laid out in the method methods and um, the practice around the germination that's uh, in the, those documents that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, but yeah, and there's the purity test. Well, by purity test, that, that's basically the amount of weed seeds. And we're, I'm saying weed seeds, but sometimes it could be just foreign seeds. It could be debris too, and it could be uh, another crop. That's not necessarily a weed, but if you do have in your packets, it becomes a weed if it's not meant to be there. Um, so if I have a few minutes here, I want to play a little game and hopefully that's going to work. I, I have actually photos of a few packets that may or may not be okay in Canada. And I would like folks to maybe use the chat box to tell me if they think that packet is uh, following the regulation, if it would pass if someone from the government would come knock at your door or if it would fail and why would it fail. So we'll start with the first one here. Uh, they're mostly Canadian, except actually, um, sorry, except that first one here. So do you think Johnny is doing a good job at identifying their packets if they were being, to be sold in Canada? Yes, 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 so far. So yeah, obviously, um, Johnny has been doing this for many years. Uh, so hopefully they got it right by now. But I mean, they are in the States, you know, there could have been some variation. But yes, so we're seeing there is a germination. Um, number, there is a date of germination, and you can see their address at the bottom there, and even have a seed lot, so that's like added bonus, and all the rest is added. Oh, and the variety name, obviously, is there. 
Okay, uh, let's see. Next one here. UBC Farm. How are they doing? <laughs> the picture is nice. Picture is nice. Thank you. <laughs> and what if there's something missing? Feel free to tell me what's missing. The address is missing. Yeah, the germ. So pretty much the only thing that we succeeded to do here at UBC Farm is to write the variety name on the packets. <laughs> Um, I, I would like to give you more background of why it is so bad. <laughs> uh, there's not that much good excuse. And just, yeah, as a disclaimer, these are the seed packets that I am sending here. I just never wanted to do seed packets, basically. That's the, the summary of my story. I want to sell in bulk. I started growing seeds and I had some seed leftovers and I started throwing them in the packets for folks at the market here and it just became something and I never improved my system. So as a disclaimer, I'm telling you what to do and I am the worst at doing it, basically. Um, I might interrupt I might and say that, that uh, you are showing that your seed is free of weeds. Yeah, true. Yeah, no, I can, people can. And it's free of diseases, themselves. you know, looks free of huh? disease or at least visible disease. Yep. <laughs> the seeds are clean. Yep. Well, thanks for the positive reinforcement, anybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, this is the next one here, Hawthorne Seeds. Hawthorne Seed are doing it. They've been doing it for many years, so we're good. Yes. Anything missing? We're seeing an address here on the back. I'm seeing some germination, a date, a variety. Everything is there. Good job, Hawthorne. Next one, BC Eco Sea Co-op. What are the BC Eco Sea Co-op doing? Anything missing here? Yeah, Heron found it. There's actually one thing missing here and it is the address. Uh, email address do not count for address. <laughs> That's, I guess, the point I wanted to make with this one here. Um, yeah, so the BC Co Co Op needs to update. This is, uh, all disclaimer, this is an old packet. Uh, the address is on right now as of this year, uh, but this was an old packet I wanted to use for this example here. And then we have salt spring seeds here. Anything missing for salt spring? A country of origin require. That's a good question, Heron. Um, I think if you're reselling, I don't think it is required actually in Canada, uh, but I think you have to be able to trace back to it if an inspector was to come, but I don't think it's required to the customers. It would be nice to declare it. So yeah, germination and the year pack and the year of germination, that's the one thing that's missing here from uh, salt spring seeds. Um, so yeah, and I think what we can see here that like uh, lot number, yeah, the lot numbers is not required. Uh, although if you wanna be able to do trace back um, in your records, it's probably strongly recommended, um, but it is not required under the seed regulation uh, act or the seed act and the seed regulations. Um, so yeah, one thing I think we all need to think about uh, when, once we know that, once we know everything that we need to have on our packets in order to, to basically show your customer about the, the quality we're talking about, um, is that you really need to think about how you're gonna work your seed packets. It's, it's a huge investment for seed companies, small seed companies developed uh, packets and develop a uh, template uh, so you've seen through those slides even how many different uh, approach there is to it. Some people print it right on the packet. Some people add a label to it. Some people have like a blank tempa template with most of the information. They just put a tiny bit more information. Uh, some people probably like stamp on it. So all of those things you should, when you go ahead and, and creating either a new template or you're creating your new business and you really need to think that through. And I think that's where I wish someone had told me that. <laughs> when I started UBC Farm Seeds and when the BC EQC Co-op Seeds started about what actually we need to be on the packets and I didn't have to dig in through those very exciting, AKA boring document from the government to find out. Uh, but I think that's something that could save um, small seed companies a lot of money too by knowing that ahead of time. And yeah, so that's, I think that's what I, oh no, I forgot one actually, West Coast Seeds. Um, one last one before I go. Is that one all right? 
Yes, yes, good. No Latin? No, it's true. They don't have Latin. Latin is not required uh, on the seed packets here. And those are all like that's that would be actually if we had time a great discussion about like what do we think as farmers that what do we want to know beyond what's required by the government um, that may be even more pertinent than what's required by the government right so we also have to think about that when we're talking about quality seeds and, and all uh, what do we want to offer to our customers too as part of it so yeah that that, that quality actually discussion I think goes beyond um, just the regulation. Uh, and I think I will leave it there and maybe we'll have a bit of time at the end for a more question, except if there's a question that came through and I didn't see, please feel free to, uh, to ask me now. Yeah, there's a couple questions. Uh, uh, thank you, Mel, that was awesome. And it's, it is interesting, the melding of regulations and sort of our social perception um, of what we think should be on a seed packet versus what is required. It's a so the couple of questions that we have is is one uh, a question about grading, and and if you don't know this, it's okay. We'll we'll like follow up with it. Is, is uh, who does the grading? Um, is do you know if there's like a person that a sample gets sent to sent to, or how does a a grade get assigned to particular seed? Uh, I believe like so we saw there was different levels of grading. There was kind of number one, number two, and then you go and certify seeds and license seeds. Um, I believe there's some level of grading, which is the Canada number one and number two. Uh, the grading is done in-house. You just need to have the records to prove it once you get inspected, if you get inspected. What I don't know, if, like if you do get inspected every year or if it's just a randomized things that if you use that classification, then you may at any point get inspected, but it may happen only every 10 years. So that's the point I don't know, but I'm fairly sure for those it's in-house. Um, so you're like basically have to keep the records to show that you're actually claim, your claim is right. And I believe that the higher grade, the pedigree seeds and certified seeds, it goes, um, you do have to get them inspected. I am unsure if it is a sample sent in or if they have provincial um, people that goes in house to do that inspection and do that sampling. So those details, I don't know about it, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's the overall that I know. Okay, one uh, second question out of three uh, is this is a is certified organic is a certifier third party certifier and certified organic required for seed to be called organic. It is provincially based. Uh, currently in BC, we do now have a regulation that say that if you're going to claim organic, you need to be certified organic. Otherwise, you could be fine. Uh, that is by province. Um, there is actually, it's city, it's by province, but the federal government do have that claim. They just never enforce it. They have no uh, arms to enforce it. So then the, pro the province took it under the, themselves to actually uh, put it in place by province to enforce it. Uh, that say the enforcement is really minimal. Um, so a lot of people still clean organic left and right uh, when they're not in the right to do so. Um, but yeah, is that that yeah, yeah. Stateside, we have to be certified to use the word organic on a product. Uh, so that's just a good clarity. I didn't know that. Um, and uh, the lot number is not required, but it sounds like it's good practice. Is that kind of your sense just as a seed person that it seems like the lot number is kind of intrinsic? Using lot numbers to track your product, whether it's for quality or just for in-house, whatever it is, do you feel that those are required, are good ideas, best practices? Yeah, I think they're good practices. I think like the line I will draw, like if you're a seed company is that you're the only person that grow the seeds ever that goes in those packets, lot number may not be that um, essential because you will probably be able to track it back no matter what because you don't have multiple seed lots, maybe overlapping or something like that. Uh, at any given point, I think if you start purchasing seeds from other farmers and reselling, I think that's when lot numbers become fairly essential because the tracing back to the source become very, uh, could become complicated and the lot number will make everything so much easier. Uh, but I think it's a personal decision in a way or, or business decision, but it is not required under the regulations. Mel, thank you so much. That was amazing. And uh, 
really appreciate you as, like you said, not a regulations person being our regulations person. It was awesome. I'll tell you the rules so you can break them with me. That's exactly. Like this is the anarchist seed book. That is what that is what this is. So everyone, just let's give uh, Mel a big little round of applause because that's a lot of homework. And I don't think I did that much homework for my part. So thank you, Mel. Um, well, everybody, just take a little moment, deep breath. We're going to transition to Matthew uh, Goldfarb uh, from Fruition Seeds, who is going to kind of walk us through like how Fruition Seeds has kind of evolved and the work they're doing currently to produce good seeds. So part of that is scale of equipment, handling your crop, getting your crop harvested and processed and dried. And Matthew has a lot to share in that realm. Thank you, Matthew. Um, thanks everybody. I'm Matthew from Fruition Seeds. We're in the Finger Lakes of New York, the Western part of the state. And from some conversations with Heron and others, just um, asking if I could share a little bit of our progression, particularly just with, with the scale of seed cleaning. And I'm not gonna go into lots of different crops and how to do it and all the different techniques because they're limitless. And for those of us that have um, either just getting started or have been to a lot of these farm visits and conferences and workshops, there's lots and lots of seed cleaning demos and videos and tutorials all over the place. Um, what I wanted to contribute was how we've, from all of our farm visits and um, tinkering around with stuff on our own kind of figured out for us a way to kind of um, be able to do this in a way, particularly with, with cucurbits, although a lot of the equipment that I'm going to show you and processes can be used with, with other seeds, um, but this is really about cucurbits and how and why we scaled that operation up. Um, so here we go. Um, so, you know, it's just thinking, I wanted to just start with <clears throat> why do we scale and what are you thinking about for your farm, your co-op, your community, your, your region, um, and really asking what those, what those reasons are of why you want to scale. Um, because you may realize there's, that's not the direction you want to go. Um, for us, when we ask those questions as we've uh, gone from season to season, um, Dandy, who is in the upper right right here, um, who was with us for about five years, would always say, we want to be doing this for a lifetime. So anytime we were doing activities that were hard on our body or hard on the soil, hard on equipment, um, hard on the plants. Uh, she would always jump in and be like, what are we doing? How are we doing this? We need to do this for a lifetime, uh, which is kind of a lot of the premise that we are operating by how we think about scale. Um, of course, there's economics to all of this, and I am going to show some of the, the economics because you have to be able to be viable year to year so you can continue to do your work. We think about the, the smallest viable audience for our operation rather than the industrial model of how big can I get. Our goal is to see how small we can stay um, and, be, and be viable. Um, the other thing that we think about a lot when we're talking about scale is um, Kind of the premise of how we function as a seed company. Our primary goal is to take care of each other. And then if we can take care of each other, we can take care of seeds. If we can take care of the seeds and the land, uh, we can take care of our community and kind of keep scaling out. But we start with the, the smallest concept of a community is two people. So um, if we can do that well, then we, we go from there. So all of our that's just to say all of our scaling questions kind of are rooted in that. And for your farm, your community, I would just say, think about it. 
um, what are the different pieces because there's a lot of different directions you can go. Um, so in this presentation, I'm just going to break down some of how we used to do it, changes we've made, how we do it now, um, and how that kind of impacts our time, our economics, health of our, our team and our bodies, and kind of availability to do other things with our lives. So uh, here we go. So this was pre um, all of the major investments that I'm going to get into. So in 2018, uh, there was about four of us on the farm. Um, and our cucurbit production was about uh, 1.75 acres over nine lots. So there was probably two watermelons, maybe a cantaloupe. Uh, we have a few different isolations so we can run different cucurbits. Um, we probably had a couple of cucumbers and maybe a pepper or two and maybe a machada in there. Um, when we tallied all of our labor, this isn't producing the stuff, this is not harvesting. We do all of our processing out of the field. Um, you could change some of these numbers if you do in-field processing. This is all after stuff has been grown, harvested, and brought to the processing station. Um, we put about 600 hours of processing time, which is seed extraction, seed cleaning, seed drying, um, and then winnowing and, or screening and, and final cleaning. So there's a little bit of <clears throat> numbers around that. Um, this year, similar, save, similar um, labor team, there was about four of us on, on the cucurbit work, a little bit less acreage, about an, uh, one and a half acres, sim same amount of lots. And we put about 90 hours in this season. Again, extraction, uh, cleaning, drying, and winnowing or screening uh, for final clean seed. Uh, so how did we get from here to there is the question. Um, so I'm just gonna start with like the macro view of the pieces of equipment that we have. A bunch of you have probably seen Mark uh, Lutera's Winnow Wizard, which we've had for a while. We use it for lots of different seed cleaning. I'm not going to go into too much details about that, but I have uh, one of my slides. I'll have all the links to this. So if it's stuff you want to learn about, you can get access to it and track everything down. Um, but we use the Winnow Wizard for final winnowing. It's this. Um, this pumpkin seed harvester, which was uh, about $4,500, which is shown right here. Um, we purchased in China and then modified with a local machine shop here. And I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, so we can now run anything from small watermelon seed or cucumber seed all the way up to your, your big uh, like Maxima seeds. Um, there's a seed dryer that we built, and I'm going to talk to you about that. And again, that's working with uh, a local friend and machinist. That was the price. And then there's this thing called a whir we call it a whirly gig. I finally have actually figured out what it actually is. I picked it up from another farm up on Lake Ontario, um, and I'll tell you more about that. But we had about twelve twelve thousand dollars in. Uh, investment and capital investments in all this equipment. So if you took the 2018 labor costs, uh, we had about $10,200 in labor. If you take the 2020 um, labor plus capital expense, and I gave a seven year depreciation to our equipment, um, I think it'll last a lot longer. And as I said, most of the equipment is used for a lot of other parts of the farm. So, uh, you know, this is giving the full value to it. Um, our operating cost for cucurbit processing was $3,600 this year. And we saved about 500 hours of time. So we can do some other things on the farm or off the farm. So just a quick run through of how we used to do our hand processing and there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. I think like we've done this for years. We still do some of our small lots if it's too much 
work to clean some of the equipment. Um, it's a great way to do it. It just takes more time, but it's a simple way to get started. So over here, we just, most of our, if it's a cucumber or watermelon, it's different, but this is just a squash. We have a little log splitter on a, kind of on a, it's a, it's a mall head on a, oh, can't think of that word on a rod that you slide up and down and split stuff open. So, uh, you know, you're not cutting seed cause you're splitting it. And then dandies over here, vacuuming out seeds. Um, so once you've got all your seeds extracted, this is a series of screens going from half inch, probably down to quarter inch, maybe a little bit smaller. It just depends what we're, what seeds we're working with. And we're just, spraying and brushing and combing seeds through each layer uh, till you get pretty clean seed. Uh, then it would go to these drying racks. We have a bunch of different drying systems. This is kind of a insulated box with a fan and a dehumidifier. Uh, these are just the screens right here. Um, we have other screens that you'll see on another slide that are four foot by eight foot because they fit our tables in our greenhouse. But then they would go to these screens um, and you have to kind of manually manage the screens so that the seeds don't cake together. We have the, the wonderful term of zhuzhing to break seeds up and kind of continually stir them by hand. Um, and the thing that is probably not shown here is the winnow wizard. So after they're cleaned, um, uh, or I guess in this, other style we would box fan, which I think most of us are familiar with uh, winnowing using box fans, but that would be the last stage until you have your clean seed. Um, in our mechanized processing, this is what we call the blue dragon, but um, I have a short video you'll see in a moment. Essentially fruits go in the top, they get, um, they get smashed up, they go through this top separator and all the big chunks come out. And then there's a, a cone at the bottom, which I think in the video will show that is scraping the seeds in the pulp. So the pulp gets scraped through, the seeds end up at another end and come spitting out. Uh, it's, it's like such a joy to use. The only part that slows us down is how fast you can load it. Um, the faster you can, if you, you know, you had a bucket that had a tilt on it, you could probably just pour right in or a conveyor or something. We just chuck them in as fast as we can go. Um, this is the Whirly Gig, which I will show you the link to if it becomes something that you think is valuable to you. Uh, there's a motor and a plate on the bottom that spins and there's, you can adjust the gap at the bottom between the plate and the bottom of the cylinder. So if your seeds are larger than your pulp, um, the seeds won't slide through the gap, but all the pulp will. Uh, and again, you'll see that in a video. So instead of using all those screens, I just take five gallon bucket, put it in, run the water, and a minute later, the, the seed is clean and you just keep going as, as fast as the machine will, if you can keep up with it. Um, and then over here in this back, this is kind of just to show you a little bit of scale. This is the dryer that we built. Um, I can't quite see it because there's some things in the way on my screen, but you can see it, here's some regular drying screens that are just on tables with fans underneath. This dryer in the back, I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on, but that's um, been an amazing way for us. We can uh, take all of the seed that we process. So if we have, as an example, I think they're doing some kind of butternut in this picture. Um, you know, we probably did two, two and a half tons of butternut. Uh, it probably took maybe an hour and a half to throw them through ma the machine and then another 20 minutes to clean it. And then you take all of that seed, which wet was probably like 250 pounds of wet seed, you put it in the barrel, turn it on, it's in the greenhouse, so it's already warm, turn the air on and kind of walk away. And then the next day, You've got clean, or you you have dry, almost clean seed. Um, da, da, da. Okay, here's the fun part. Just so, and I'll 
I think there's going to be some noise from the video. Uh, put your earbuds on and I'll kind of walk you through what's happening. So as you can see COVID times. Uh, Janine and Chelsea are just chucking them in as fast as they can. That looks like honey nut going in. So it's getting broken up, grinded down, goes into the top chamber, which is this blue chamber. There's some slots so the smaller material can fall through and then all the big stuff's coming out back. If you were gonna run this in the field, you don't need somebody doing that. You just slowly run along, uh, drive along with the tractor. This is what the coner is. And you can see the, the pulp gets pushed out through the holes. And there's some seed and bits of pulp. Uh, and now I think, let's see. Nope. There we go. Let's stop that. And this is just a quick little video of the whirly gig. It's not going to blow your mind, but you know, it's a spiral. Uh, so that's, well, I'll let it play. So what this front side, you could see um, like some orangish water pouring out. That's coming out the bottom where you adjust the gap. So seeds are not coming out there. There might be flat seeds that didn't mature, or maybe some of the really small seeds might. Um, but mostly that's just the stringy pulp and some of the smaller bits. And I just run it till the water's clear. And then right here, there's this lift gate uh, right there. Um, I would lift that gate up and we have a little screen box. Let's see if it shows it. Nope. Uh, you know, you catch your seed and then you just load on the next one. Uh, okay. Matthew, Matthew, a little question just to interrupt yes. you. Um, question from Annie. Um, how long do they take to clean? And, uh, and I, I think what oh. she means is clean out between varieties. Ah, um, good question, Annie. The, so the dragon, the blue dragon, um, we've modified it. It came with uh, in the coner, which I think was like that orange barrel at the bottom. Uh, it was just one size whole and it was too big for some of our like cucumber seeds or small watermelon seeds. So, and it became really troubling to actually clean it out. So you knew you were gonna have no seed contamination. Um, so we've made an, an entirely separate barrel. So when we clean out that machine, we take the coner out, which is off, half of it off, which is the hardest part to clean. Um, but I would say between lots, yeah, that's the slowest part. Uh, two people under a half hour um, to get it totally cleaned and ready for the next lot. Um, we typically have only been doing one lot a day because I don't want to mess with screens in the drying. Um, so we just put one lot in the dryer. When we've done smaller lots, I might put uh, some, put a double bag. Like we have these mesh bags that we've made that we put in the dryer. So you could do two or three different lots, but um, you know, you could, you could definitely get through a lot of, a lot of different lots in a day. But for us, it's, it, we've gotten it down to about a half hour now that we've, it takes some tinkering to, you know, figure out your, uh, your systems and, the best way, but the the clean out is is sometimes longer than the processing. Um, but I'm gonna, if it's good, I'll just talk about this dryer that we built. Um, so in this first picture, you're looking this this uh, face, this panel uh, has some rubber latches, so you can remove it. We have a a floor jack at the bottom, so when you're loading it, you jack up the front end, dump your seed in so it doesn't pour out and then put the cover back on, uh, lower the jack and then it's level. And then you come around to this back side. Uh, this is a variable speed control. There's about a, I think a one and a half horsepower motor underneath here with a big belt drive around it. Um, so we can control the speed of the revolutions. Um, 
I'm probably, I mean, it, it depends what I'm doing. So sometimes I actually use it as a thresher. Uh, I'll put in like, I'll fill that thing with beans and just turn it on and spin it a little bit faster, maybe uh, one revolution per 15 seconds. And then I come back a few hours later and all the beans are threshed, which is fun. Um, when I'm doing the squash or cucurbits, it just depends on how warm it is and other factors or how much seed there is, but it might be one revolution per 30 seconds, maybe one revolution per 45 seconds. It just, just depends. You kind of get a feel for it. And then this, uh, we had tried a squirrel cage blower that kept overheating. So we just picked this up at the hardware store. It's like a floor dryer. That's really, really powerful. Um, and we just rage air through the bottom. And then um, it comes up into the barrel. And as this barrel is rotating, uh, the air is coming through all the perforated holes from the bottom. So it's the air is kind of coming up into the drying chamber. Um, we just have a few wooden bars across just to keep the seeds tumbling. If you don't have some, we've learned if you don't have something there, the seeds just kind of sit on the bottom and wait, wait for you no matter how fast you get the revolutions going. Um, but this thing has been, everything that we've purchased has more than paid for itself in the first season. Um, this has been a, a huge change for the amount of just hand labor we have to do as we're bringing in lots, um, whether it's you know, any wet seeded crop, you could, if we were doing tomatoes, we could probably get four or five different tomatoes in here in mesh bags and they're all just tumbling. And then the next morning they're done uh, that, you know, that they're singulated because they didn't cake together. You give it a quick winnow and you move on with life. So um, it's really been fun. And this is something that um, I've seen similar concepts around that are just way over engineered. There's a company out in California, Rock Rock Somebody, I had spoken to for a while because I had seen a piece at High Mowing that High Mowing had purchased. And I think they were around 12,000 bucks before you ship it. Um, and those just more bells and whistles. The only other thing that I would say, and so if anybody's interested in this, I know I'm working with Heron to get some drawings. We just kind of scratch this out on a piece of paper and built it. So there's no like genuine specs, but I'm going to work some details out with Heron. Um, so if anybody else wants those specs, I'm happy to talk through it with you. Um, the only other thing I would offer is if you're doing, if you're not doing this in the, you know, obviously when you're doing some of your work, it gets later into the season and you don't want to heat the whole greenhouse. Um, we just have like a little propane space heater, um, like a garage style space heater that we just put in front of this intake a foot away. Whoops, you don't need to see that. Uh, and then it's sucking in hot air if it happens to be cold in November when we're processing seeds. And it gets that initial dry down uh, a lot quicker. So when you're you're not dealing with seeds that are wet for two days while you're waiting for them to dry down, get them done overnight. Uh, this is the Winnow Wizard. I'm not going to talk too much about it other than check out Mark Lutera's site. They're awesome. If you're um, saving any seeds and all seeds, it really makes a huge difference in the, the quality and cleanliness of your seeds and just not ending up with repetitive motion damage to your elbow, shoulders, wrists, neck, nose, and everything else. So uh, it's pretty great. But after we'd pull it out of the barrel, we'd just uh, run it through the hopper and let it do its thing. Um, so here is just a, if anybody needs to screen grab that, you can. Uh, the pumpkin seed harvester is from this company, Shuli Machinery out of China. Lisa is the contact that I've worked with. I will tell you the whole time I was doing it, I thought it was a scam, um, but it worked. I got it. Uh, 
and it's been incredible. The Whirly gig is actually made by this company that's been around since the 50s called Di I'm not going to pronounce it, but they pronounce it when you watch their video, but dybvigccleaner.com. Uh, I think it's pretty overpriced, but it's pretty amazing. And I think you could probably modify something to do exactly what it does. Like I said, the custom dryer, happy to send a sketch concept. There's my email if it's something you think is useful to you. And there's Mark's uh, Winnow Wizard site. So check him out. Um, and I guess in closing, you know, I just want to kind of come back to this idea of, you know, the trade-offs that we make. Um, we used to do a lot of our uh, big fall processing with our community and we just have big, big community processing days. People helped extract seed and then they took all the fruit home. Um, this year in, in COVID times, that's not happening. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to get at uh, the problems you're trying to solve for and the communities you're trying to serve. So um, for us, again, thinking about these, this scale is uh, allowing us to continue our work so we can take those 500 hours that we've kind of taken out of our processing time and think about where else can we put that into self-care, farm care, community care. Um, so that's just something for y'all to think about. Um, and maybe one, one last piece that I hadn't mentioned earlier that I had gleaned over, which is um, we haven't, we've, we've done with a couple farms this year um, where um, we've done some contracts where we've been able to, um, that allowed them to scale their production, but they weren't set up for that type of scale for processing. And we were now happy to just take on their squash. So uh, we just took a trailer and, uh, you know, loaded up six or eight uh, bins of squash and drove it back to the farm and got it all processed. Um, so another way to think about your scaling or equipment or infrastructure is you can also support a broader community um, in being part of the seed system where they might not be, they're set up to grow and produce but and harvest, but not do all of the, the processing side of it. So it's uh, just another avenue as you explore this. And I think I'll uh, exit out from there. Amazing. I love the idea of 500 more hours of life. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, so of it's reassuring that there's answers and that there's answers at scale and there's shareable answers. Um, one question that we had from um, Marie Claude was, is the Blue Dragon puff um, on the, is that on a PTO or is that on a uh, engine or, and could it be uh, retrofitted either way. It's a PTO, uh, but if you have an engine that has a PTO drive, um, you can do it. Yeah, I see. I often see these this type of this not this specific, but other machinery from China or India retrofitted with a, a high the Honda large Honda engine. Yeah. So some so oftentimes there's somebody in your community who can do that. Um, so. You know, even if it's if you don't have a PTO, you can often get these retrofitted for not a ton of money. Usually, adds like a thousand or two thousand to the price. Depends on the size of the engine. Um, so, Matthew, thank you. Um, I will ask everyone to take a little stretch with their arms for a second. Whew, some some amazing stuff going on in this depth content, um, and we're gonna uh, we are gonna go over today. Um, because we have some really great presenters here. Um, and one of them is Yvonne Montpelier, who I uh, worked with for many, many moons at Fedco. Um, Yvonne was, is probably a person, in my opinion, that I've ever met who knows the most about the inner workings of seed. Um, she spent years being the germination lab steward and evolving that at Fedco, testing 
every lot of seed that crossed our doorstep, whether from a large supplier or from a grower, and was familiar with many of the pitfalls. Um, Fedco started when I started there with basically these refrigerator, actually, no, I would think I came in when they're right when we were making sort of a little couple of years later, we had these fridges made or I don't know, we had fridges and they updated and they were just like these insulated boxes with these light bulbs. And um, Yvonne kind of evolved that process. And uh, now she was such a trusted, both counter of seed and quality control manager uh, that uh, she got a job at a bank. They trust her with other people's money now. So um, Yvonne is going to walk us through germination testing. Uh, Yvonne, are you ready to roll? Ryan, how's that? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, I am such a uh, really terrible at uh, computer stuff, so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> um, so I thought the slides, I'll probably um, wait a little bit to the end to show as a sort of a summary. Um, and I'm so distracted by all that equipment, I have to refocus here. Um, so I will talk about uh, the germination testing, um, sampling. Um, so the purpose of seed testing, of course, is to determine the value of the seed that we're going to plant. And the purpose of having standard rules is to um, allow for uniformity and repeatability of the test methods so that we get results that we can all understand that a certain seed went through a certain process and this was the outcome. And um, for testing seed on your farm, or maybe like we were talking about, maybe uh, being part of, you know, in the community of other farms that you'd like to test, help test their seed, um, developing a routine and record keeping are really gonna be vital instruments. Um, in your lab and uh, you're gonna to learn to recognize what a normal seed is, an abnormal seed, deficiencies, diseases. So the more you can keep track of all of this, um, in the end, you'll, it'll benefit your, your, uh, your skill, really. Um, so I would really, that's one of my, record keeping is really one of my, uh, my big points to make here. And, um, oops, hang on a second. So when you get a lot of seed from a lot, literally of seed from uh, whether it's your farm or someone else's farm, you are going to want to find out as much about that crop while it was growing, while it was being harvested, how it was cleaned, and how it was packaged, because all of that is going to have clues that are going to express themselves in a germination lab. Uh, you want to know about the field conditions, the weather conditions, was there insect pressure, disease pressure, this is all going to show up. And you're going to want to be able to read this when you open up your test. So these are all things that you want to try to get. You're kind of like a detective, you want to get as much information as you can from either your notes in the field or the seed that you're receiving to test. And so now when you get your container of seed, uh, you're gonna open that seed up, that container up, and you're really gonna use your basic instinct. Um, you're gonna look at it and your first thought is gonna be, it looks good, clean, uh, is it shiny, is it, you know, whatever it is, if we were, if we were talking about uh, squash, um, you want it to be plump, you want it to be somewhat shiny, is it consistent, is the size consistent, you're sort of taking note of all of this when you first open that bag, you're gonna, you're gonna have a real feeling of this is gonna be good seed, or it's not. Um, is there debris in there? You really don't want to test anything with debris. Um, it's gonna cause trouble in the lab where you're adding moisture, heat, you're gonna have problems. So you really want it to be as clean as you can. Sometimes you will want to do a test that um, sort of just to get an idea of what kind of quality you're coming across. Maybe you're not gonna, you know, is it worth testing fully cleaning and spending all of those hours uh, cleaning it? You just wanna get a quick idea 
and that's okay, but it's certainly not going to be your official count. So um, the cleaner the seed is, the better off you're going to be. Um, you're going to you're going to see if is there a smell to it? Is it moldy smelling? Is it is it musty? You want it to be fresh. There shouldn't be any of that um, moldy kind of smell going on. And you're going to also stick your hand right in the bag. You'll see if it's wet or dry, or you're going to use all of all of those senses. Um, beans, when they're just right, they make a clinking sound, and that's just something that you learn. That's not really any way I could teach you that. But um, the more you do it, these things just come naturally that you're going to instinctively know, like this is going to be great seed. This is going to be a challenge. Um, so the more you can do your little detective work, you're going to really uh, benefit um, and build that skill. Um, I can give you an example. Um, and Heron, you know this one well, the pea weevil. Um, you open up the bag, it looks absolutely beautiful. The pea weevil leaves this incredibly small perforated circle that you can barely see. Um, eats the entire seed out and is useless to plant. Um, you really need to get in there, look at it. Is it discolored? Is it uniform? Are there these little perforated circles that we need to look for? There's insect damage. Uh, if it is a finished product, um, or if it's not, we're gonna have we're gonna send it back to our seed cleaning guy, and we're gonna have him clean it some more. See if we can get some of that out. Um, and uh, it's, I did mention the debris in the lab. That is really something you want to watch out for. Um, and once you have that product that you say, I think this is what we want to test. I'm a big fan of labeling. I'm a big fan of um, assigning a lot number for tracking purposes. Um, you've just gathered all of this information about how it was grown and how it was harvested, how it was stored. That lot number is going to help you keep track of all of this. Um, and also, you want to put a, a label inside and outside of that bag. Um, and, and Yvonne, I uh, just want to chime in, Yvonne, I just wanted to, and it, it seems like part of this is also, let's say you're that very same variety or from that very same grower the next year, you know, you're looking at that same cucumber. And as you Correct. accumulate notes about every year you've germ tested that cucumber, the weather variables, well, the, whatever's in that, you know, whether it's perfect or problematic, it helps you refer to those uh, every time you're handling that particular variety or similar seed. That's correct. That will carry over um, oftentimes and well, especially at a seed, a large seed company, you know, a, a held over lot. If I see an expression of seed and I know the seed was held over, I can look back and and there's my information. I know how it was grown. I have whatever little detective work I have. And I'm going to use that to then be part of that that second year test to determine is this something that we do want to sell. So um, I would really um, that is all really good information that you want to hang on to. Um, it's going to help you make your final decision about getting the seed ready to sell. Um, I did want to talk about taking a sample. Um, a sample is really a snapshot of that seed at that particular time. So um, you're going to get that sample. If somebody buys it and drives off and leaves it in their trunk for a couple of weeks, you know, so it's really just a snapshot of what you have in your hand. Um, and the goal of that sample that you're going to take is to obtain a representative sample of that lot. So with your hand, they do make tools, but your hand works perfectly well, um, is to reach into the bag and from all the corners and all the, you know, get a little bit from, from each area. And that's gonna be your primary sample. You're gonna mix that all up. And then from that mixed up amount, you're gonna take your composite sample. So it's very much like taking a soil sample. If you think about your field, um, you're going to go out, we have an acre field, 
You're gonna get a little bit of dirt from everywhere. You're gonna mix it all up and that's what you're gonna submit for your sample. So it's very similar to that. It just happens to be a bag of seed. Um, there is a recipe that, that is uh, recommended. Um, if you have one to six containers of seed, say you have six five gallon buckets, that you would take a sample from each of those. If you have more than six, um, generally speaking, you would take five containers plus 10%. So if you have 50 containers, you're gonna take the five plus the 10%. So you're gonna test 10 of those containers. Um, on the home scale, you're probably not gonna come into that necessarily. Maybe you'll just have a few bags and a sample from each bag will be sufficient. Um, but that's just for a general idea of how much you may need um, and how to take a larger sample. So when you're getting ready to take your sample that you'll be testing, um, it depends on um, if you're going to do a home test, usually 400 seeds is plenty. So if you have your composite sample, you're going to take a free run. You can't hand pick all the good stuff out. You've got to take the, the first 100 that come. That's going to be test one. Do it again, 100, test two, test three, and test four. And you're going to keep those separate, those 400, lots of 100 seed uh, separate through your entire test. If you are going to send to a lab, um, there are um, there's certain specs. It depends. You're going to want to call the lab and in some cases, they want a certain number of seed. In some cases, they want a certain weight. And it depends on the type of seed. Uh, usually that, like the um, cover crops and things are more by weight where vegetable seed is more by count. So that is one thing you would wanna consider if you do end up sending, taking a sample and sending it to a lab, you're gonna to wanna to call them and see how much they need. Um, so, now you've got your 400 seeds. Um, are we are we all up to snuff here? <laughs> you following me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So now we're gonna we're gonna get our test ready. Um, I'll just use uh, squash just for the sake of consistency here. Um, the regulations for that would be um, you're gonna do. Well, you can test it on blotter, which would be basically um, a somewhat thick paper towel. And I'll show you slides of these as we get to the end. Um, they are going to be tested at 20 degrees, 20 degrees Celsius for 16 hours, 30 degrees for eight hours. And if you are unable to monitor them every day, you're gonna go with the lower temperature. Then there is a spec that is, it's you're gonna do, how many days will this test last? Squash in particular is seven days. So the first count is at three days. And you're going to take that, you're going to open that test up at three days. You're gonna look and see what's grown, put it back in. If there's not done another seven days and the other spec that goes along with squash is that the that the uh, material needs to be dry. So I'm gonna just go grab a, some paper, hang on. So I, just for the sake of, uh, I don't have any germ paper because I'm not in the, in the seed world much anymore. So I just got some regular old paper towel. So what you're going to want to do, you've got your 400 seeds, each separated out in lots of 100. You're going to figure out how many towels you're going to need and you're going to put them in a tray similar to this. You don't want it much deeper. This is really just the size of a regular propagation tray. It's just heavier than like a seed tray because you're going to want to dump the water out of it. So you're going to need to be able to pick it up. Um, you're going to get the amount of towels you need and that's something that you'll learn. Um, the larger the seed the more towels you'll need because 100 is not going to fit on this square. Probably I would put maybe 25 on a square this big. And you're going to put it into your tray. You're going to pour water on it. Go make yourself a cup of tea. Come back 
and then you're gonna wring it out and where the squash is dry, is they want a dry test. You're gonna really wring, wring and wring and wring it out. And then dump your water. Um, and also, if you don't have two of these, you're going to want to take any excess water out of this tray. And unroll your paper. Now, if the if you can press on this paper and water pools onto it, it's still too wet. You're going to want to keep wringing it out. If you need to, if you have too many and you can't wring it out tight enough, separate it into two. You know, roll one, get it out. Um, the nice thing about this is when it is wet, you can kind of tell you'll, and this again, you'll learn with just with experience that you'll learn sort of the right color. Um, if it's a dark, dark brown, it's probably too wet. And you'll see in the slides too, where as they have gone through their test, the color of the paper actually changes. Um, so that's just something that you will learn as you do it. Um, then you'll put your seeds down like I said, I would probably put 25 on there. You're gonna cover it and you're gonna roll it up just like a burrito, but not tight. Can you see how that's not tight? Okay, so you don't want it. You want air circulation in there. So you're not gonna do this to it. You're gonna make sure that there's some room in there. You want the towels touching on both sides. So you're gonna press it in and do a nice loose roll and you will line them up in your tray. Um, I used, for the most part, just a regular propagation tray with a lid, really common. You can get them at any hardware store. Um, and in the slide, you'll see that I would label the propagation tray um, with the lot number and what it is and how many rolls it takes to get the 100 seeds done. So if I did 25 and in each of these for a squash, I would say four, you know, four rolls is this type of seed. Um, the other types of seed, if you were to do um, like herbs, um, I did do tomatoes and peppers in these as well, is a Petri dish. Um, you can just get them at any lab uh, supply store. And then this is actually germination blotter paper. Um, the key to these is that you want the paper to fit really well in here. Otherwise, the seeds will roll around in the cracks. Um, so when you go to order this, if this is the route you want to take, um, make sure that you do a little research and get the paper that will, like, a, I, I used anchor paper. I don't know why. I just came across them first, and they had what I wanted. They will give you the diameter of the paper. They can cut them to different sizes so that you can match your Petri dish. Um, some of these are square. It's totally, doesn't matter. However you are comfortable, whichever one you like. The great thing about these is you can write right on them what your test is. So if you're testing lemon balm, you can write lemon balm right on there. Um, and it will stay through the whole test. You won't have to label the outside of the container. So that's a little overview of the paper products, um, but you'll see pictures of those. We can loop back around with that. Um, let's see, I did want to talk to you about the color of the paper, which we did. So now your test is in there. Day three comes, you're gonna open that test up. Again, does it look, how does it look? Does it look pretty fresh or is there, is there a smell to it? You're gonna use all of your senses here. Um, what you're looking for is the emergence and development of essential structures of that seed. Um, and in that three days, what happened? Did it grow at all? Is there anything moldy? Do you want to get it out of there? Um, are you, you're kind of, you're, it's not a vigor test, you're not, but you do want to take note of in three days, it did this in seven days, it got to this point. Um, and you're gonna start to learn that um, what a normal seed is, it has the essential structures and the ability to produce a plant. Abnormal seed, uh, it has defects that's gonna prevent the normal growth. And the abnormalities could include missing roots, um, stunted, 
decay, broken, um, broken pieces. You'll see there's some slides um, that have mechanical damage and uh, the cotyledons are actually broken. Um, there could be hard seed, which um, doesn't absorb water, but it doesn't rot. So you're gonna press down on it. And if it's solid, it's good seed and it would be considered hard seed. There's dormant seed. Um, it could take up water, but it's not gonna be as hard as hard seed, but it's not gonna squish like a dead seed. Dead seeds are very evident and you can remove them immediately from the test so that the other good seed doesn't get contaminated. Um, if there is disease seed, I'm like really concentrating on disease seed, but that's what you, that's, you know, that's really what we're looking for because uh, we're trying to get a, you know, a snapshot of this lot. Um, so if there, okay, so we're gonna monitor your lab. Um, you're looking for um, heating and cooling and moisture and air circulation during that three to seven days. Um, you're evaluating the growth. Um, you're going to remove anything that is complete. Um, if it has all of the parts at three days, if you've got your roots and your hypocotyl and your cotyledons in that three days, you can count that. You're going to keep a tally. 50 seeds have at three days, 50 seeds have that. Put the test back in. You're going to recount at seven days. You're going to take those numbers and you're going to average them out and that will be your germ rate. Okay, so here, um, you, this is rice seed and you can see that there's black specks on there. Um, that's your first clue, you're going to have a problem. <laughs> that's a uh, alternaria, it can cause damping off. Um, the seed will probably germinate in, in the lab, but you're going to want to take note of that. You can go to the next one. So this is the rolled seed, uh, the, se the seeds in the rolls, I'm sorry. Um, you can see how they're loose. Uh, you can see that they're jumping right out of there. Um, you can see how I labeled them. So these are flowers. Um, that is the catalog number and the lot number and the date that the test was put in. Um, you can see that's just a regular propagation tray that I've used. Um, the lid is standing up in the background. Um, as far as putting those into any sort of, um, those tests were done warm um, in a heated room, oftentimes Heron's office. <laughs> um, and to keep them from drying out too fast, especially if I was going to be gone all weekend, um, I would just use a heavy plastic bag um, I could fit two tests stacked on top of each other, tie up the end and, and it could stay uh, warm enough in that room with the, with the heat on. Um, something similar to uh, what Matthew has for his drying room um, would certainly work if you had a room in your barn or your house that you were willing to um, turn over into a little lab. Um, you could certainly heat or cool if that's what the test um, called for, uh, in the case of squash, we were talking about it'd be a warm test. Um, you would just put a thermostat in there and a light perhaps uh, would be warm enough to heat that. You can go to the next one. Those are morning glories. Uh, you can see the thickness of that paper there um, and how the color change, I don't know if you can see maybe the color change there. That's towards the end of the test there. So uh, the paper is getting to be dry. Uh, right in the center of that, just a little bit to the right, you can see there's a hard seed. Um, that, that's that's that, little, that little black one. Black one, yep, right there, yep. Yep, so you can see it's perfectly good, looks great. It's not gonna do anything in that lab right there, um, but it's viable seed and it would be counted in the germ total. Those are some brassicas. Those are the uh, dishes that I was talking about. Uh, you can see how they, they fit. The paper fits right in there. Um, they do push right up against the lid when they're, when they're that 
healthy. Uh, you can see the roots are down along the paper. You go ahead. Uh, this is onion seed. Um, sometimes you just have a, a primary infection here. It's going to just affect um, the seed coat, not necessarily the growth. That's obviously consuming everything. <laughs> I realized how many pictures I had of things that went wrong. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> it's so helpful. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. You can skip over that one. Uh, that's more of the same. So you can see there's some healthy thing. There's some healthy seed here. This is corn, some healthy seed. It's got that nice root. It's doing its thing, but but there's some some uh, some problems with that seed right there. But you're going to take note of this. So next year, if this lot comes around, or maybe even the same supplier, you know, you want to keep track of of these things. That's again the the infections coming up through that paper. This is a little bit thicker paper. This is um, the ones in the other are 38 weight. Uh, these I think were 43 or 48. I, I didn't use them very often. Um, they really retain too much water for tests. Um, I had a lot better luck with the thinner paper. Go ahead. So here again, uh, this is a seed coat issue. Um, this was actually caused by humidity and storage. Uh, you can see it's going to make a perfectly good plant. It's got all the essential parts. Um, not going to last long after this season. So you can either plant that, but it's not going to last. That's going to deteriorate the seed coat pretty quickly. But you can see the, the difference of the healthy plant and being consumed by what was storage damage. That's the same. So you can see how it's deteriorating the, the, the seed coat. Yep, I guess, I think I really liked this. I thought it was um, kind of interesting. <laughs> ah, that's just totally, that is an abnormal seed, no matter how you cut it, that did not pass anything. You can see the stunted roots, um, the cotyledon is pretty much gone. Uh, actually, in some cases they can be 50%, but I would fail this for sure. Um, looks like maybe there's some lesions on the hypocotyl. I would not pass that at all. Go ahead. Uh, this is a dirt test. Don't underestimate the uh, dirt test. We do those often, especially for larger seed, um, sunflowers even, um, but beans definitely, soybeans. Um, things that just didn't do well sitting on a paper towel, we would use the dirt test. They do sell trays that that um, that have a hundred plug flat, which is convenient for your test. Um, I usually just used a propagation tray and tried to make them as evenly spaced as I possibly could, um, which also, uh, when you're doing the test on the paper, you do want to spread them out. Um, that'll eliminate a lot of problems. And I think I did mention that, but it really is pretty major to be able to spread that seed out, let everybody have some room, let them have their water. This is over dried um, at the after harvest. Um, these are beans. Um, probably discovered that when I opened the bag and they didn't sound right. I probably went in, grabbed hair and <laughs> had to see. <laughs> we had to investigate. So we cut them open and sure enough, they were over dried. So uh, they would not germinate. Go ahead. This is mechanical damage. There's a few slides of these. You can just kind of go through them. Uh, abnormal bean. This is all mechanical damage here. Yep. So this test, I think, um, can you go ahead one or is, is that the, yeah, okay, you can go back. Thanks. Yeah, this one, um, see how the, the leaves are really wet um, and the, 
the stems are really kind of disintegrating. I have a feeling that um, I would retest this one, I think, because I have a feeling that it was probably Friday afternoon and I didn't think that it would go all weekend without my attention, so I watered it. <laughs> so I think this was a, a human error. Um, I think I overwatered it and came back Monday morning and that's probably what I found. Um, the wet leaves are indication of overwatering, I would say. So I would retest that. In some cases, you're gonna you're gonna say this was human error. Um, I think that is one of them. Or it could be bacterial. I mean it yeah could well be there both. is some definitely yeah. bacterial going on there. But as far as like the dampness of the of the leaves, I would say I overwatered it and and uh, but yes there's definitely some other issues in that tray. <laughs> yeah go ahead. Um, actually, Yvonne, just as a clarifying question that came up for these, could you just um, quickly specify how you know that's over? Oh, I, know. Um, I wish I had taken a, 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 you know, the outside of that bean, but um, most likely I opened the bag and I have an uncanny way of knowing when things are, when beans, especially or peas are too damp, uh, they make a certain sound. Um, when you pick them up and just drop them back on themselves, it probably sounded weird to me. <laughs> if they're too damp, they they kind of thud. If they're just right, they kind of clink. Um, these, there was something about them that made me suspicious and I cut them open and, and that's what we found. Um, it's not something I could really teach you. Um, it's definitely, under, uh, I think that these are over. These are yeah. Over. To me, sometimes it's a wax. It's kind of like a. What happens when they get overdried is that the oils from the bean themselves basically cook, and it's almost like, the bean is almost. It almost feels like popcorn, like it feels too light, almost. Yeah. Or it's yeah. it's like oh, but it also kind of feels a little bit. I don't know. It just. It feels to me like popcorn. That's kind of how if the sound it makes, mm -hmm. just a little bit of a lighter sound. And you can see that the browning of the interior of the seed coming around the coat is basically the oils of the seed having mm -hmm. basically cooked. Yeah. The last one is, see, now that is beautiful. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. And don't underestimate the, uh, the simplicity of the dirt test for sure. Um, you know, you can avoid all of the purchasing of of uh, the towels and whatnot. And as far as the towels are concerned, um, they can be a little pricey. Um, I would just call the companies and see what size, you know, amounts you can buy. Sometimes they'll, they'll work with a smaller company where you don't have to buy a whole case of something. Um, but the dirt test you can see right there is always nice. <laughs> All right. Yvonne, thank you. Sure. Back in the saddle. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, um, I wonder if there's any quick questions. Um, Steph, do you want to load the last little bit of slides? And uh, yeah. Marie, Cl Marie Cloud and I are going to do a little quick uh, thing. Um, we'll just see if we have any uh, Q&A. Looks OK. We'll save it to the end then. I'm just going to talk a little bit about testing, um, seed testing for diseases and GMOs and just testing in general and seed health in general real quick. Uh, just scroll down one there, Steph. There we go. So seed testing considerations, like Yvonne said, um, honest, correct sample is key to actual useful testing results. Like if you're not being honest about your sampling, you're not gonna get honest results. And that is gonna affect both your customers and it's gonna affect your outcome down the line. Uh, healthy seed, it really supports your future seed crops. And that means people buying your seed crops and your success with your own future seed. So if you're using your st stock seed from your seed productions and you are really gonna shine on something you're seeing in the test or you're seeing in the field, you're just gonna compound that issue uh, forward. So, you know, take a deep breath, be honest with yourself. Sometimes this is not as bad as it seems, but don't pretend. Uh, and just be clear that healthy seed is framing the reputation of your seed and all other craft producers of our scale. So we're in the, basically the formative stages 
uh, of people understanding the value of small scale and medium scale seed work. And we need to recognize that when one of us is putting stuff out into the marketplace, no matter how pretty the packet is uh, and it's poor quality, it reflects on many of us. So let's just take a community stance here. Uh, become the expert of your seed. If you're growing, whether you're growing seed for yourself or you're growing seed for other people, um, do not necessarily trust that the, that either your contact with the seed company or you know don't just trust it to the luck. If you're being asked to grow a particular seed or a particular variety, it behooves you to do your research on that crop as well as on that particular uh, variety. Uh, next slide. Um, so these are just basically sample submission forms you know, for disease testing. You know, become familiar with them. You know, all these things that we're talking about, we have to take the time and make the time as Mel has to call these labs, um, as we've talked in different sessions, uh, treat yourself as a business. If you are making money from selling seed, whether to on contract or direct to customers, you are a business, represent yourself as such and expect such treatment. Uh, go forward. Um, this is part of learning your trade, research, understanding what's going on. Uh, read books, people. It's not all online. Uh, become the expert in your seed. Um, next slide. Uh, here is an example of an expert in seed. This is Calvin Keeney, who is considered the father of modern bean breeding and all pretty much all of the beans that we grow today, green beans. Um, this person pretty much bred like a bunch of them that either are still in existence or are parent lines from his work. Uh, he was from New York and this is him. This is his pea production. This is a note. These are notes from his like productions where he is telling himself that's how tall this particular pea is. This is how many pods it has. This is how big the pods are. This is basically we can do a lot of this work now with phone, with our iPhone, with our cell phone, but document everything. It will save you in the long run because your customer expects you to know. They expect to be able to call you and you wouldn't believe how many customers you're gonna call you someday and say, I planted two types of beans and I forgot to label one. And can you tell me just from this picture of the cell phone, which row is which bean from these leaves? And if you are been paying attention to seed growing, you can answer that question. Uh, one thing about GMO seed uh, testing, uh, there is the PCR test, which is a more expensive test. Uh, requires a larger seed sample somewhere in the, generally in the 10,000 seeds. So it's a little bit tough for some of this that are on a smaller scale. There's also what's called a dipstick or strip test, uh, which is less accurate. But again, honest testing. When something says you need uh, 3,000 seeds, what they mean, as, uh, as Yvonne said, is they want you to take four, sorry, eight samples of 400 seeds, which actually is 3,200 3, seeds. They want those samples to be related to a lot size of lot. They want them to be taken from different bags. So that's how you actually represent. So when we come to the customer as the craft or medium scale seed producer, if we can show that we know our stuff, that is part of this quality assurance thing. We need to be those experts. We need to be constantly learning. We need to constantly share what we have, share what we know. And we basically need to create an atmosphere that we are skilled producers, just like a small scale distillery or a small scale beer you know, br brewer. This is what we are. We are craft producers and we are craftspeople. So Marie Claude, I wondered if you just had a few comments about your experiences with phytosanitary certificates and testing. Uh, thank you so much. Um, well, just some quick comments. Um, so for so as a contract grower, I export seeds to the United States. And um, so if you're a seed company, you can either export when when I say export, I, I mean, uh, I'm talking from the Canadian side. So you can um, export either small lots or bigger lots. And that's defined in the um, if you look on the USDA um, website, I think yeah, the website is, uh, yeah, it, their system is called APHIS, so A-P-H-I-S, and it's .usda.gov, G-O-V. 
Um, so basically, a small seed sample um, doesn't need a phyto certificate. And to be considered a small seed lot, it, the seed count needs to be 50 or less, or less than 10 grams. So if you're a seed company doing retail, you probably meet those requirements and you don't need a phyto certificate. However, if you, um, thank you, Steph. <laughs> However, if you um, are a contract grower and you um, export bigger lots, uh, that's when you need a phyto sanitary certificate. So that means that you will need to contact the Canadian Food Inspection Agency um, you and there's still um, so you still have to file a PDF, uh, fill out a PDF file. Um, I think next year they'll they're gonna do it online, but this year it's still a PDF file. And basically, you just list the Latin name, the weight of the seeds you want to export, the importer name. Of course, they want to know you know your address and your business name, and they want you to have a commercial invoice as well and they will just come to your uh, place of business and, uh, and visually inspect the seed lot um, and looking for, you know, um, they're looking, basically they wanna know if the seed is clean enough, if it's free of, of weed seeds. And, uh, but, you know, at the same time, uh, some, they, the seed can be carrying pathogens and they won't be able to visually see it. So it's not like a guarantee that the seed is uh, healthy or free of pathogens, um, but it, at least it passes the, the visual inspection and that's enough for them to be issuing the phytosanitary certificate. Um, however, as Adrian mentioned uh, yesterday, yes, it was yesterday, um, there's a new regulation for peppers and tomato seeds uh, because there's this new virus around that's called the tomato, no, is that brown, tomato brown rugose fruit virus or something like that. Um, and it, so last year um, it was introduced in Canada. So CFI wasn't still, it was, wasn't in their data database, so they were still able to issue the phyto certificate. But this year, um, they're aware that this virus is in Canada, and so you need further testing for CFI to be able to certify that the pepper or tomato seed is free of this uh, virus. And um, yeah, at this point, um, at this time of year, I'm still, um, they're still not up to date because apparently there aren't that many of us that are exporting tomato and pepper seeds. <laughs> I might be the only one. Um, and so they, they need to uh, catch up on the, on the new developments. And also, um, you know, the, some of the labs might not have protocols yet for testing seeds for this virus. Uh, they might have one for testing plants, but I'm still, you know, contacting, contacting labs to see if um, where they are on that. Um, I was reading though that um, I can still export tomato and pepper seeds if it's to be tested in an American lab. So if um, if Canadian labs don't have protocols, I can still send out the seed to um, the United States to be tested uh, without a phytosanitary certificate. Um, I just need to file like another document that's it has like a letter and number it doesn't have a specific name um yeah that's um that's where I'm at right now <laughs> all right <laughs> the, yeah the puzzle thank you thank you Marie Claude yes that would be a situation where a person could ship seed to a private lab as we mentioned yesterday such as Agdia so you could ship that disease seed with that special form to the lab in the United States uh, legally to get tested, which is great news. Um, there's a couple questions about back to overdried seed. How does a seed get overdried? Um, well, I was just looking to the right of me and I have some seed uh, that is drying um, in mesh bags uh, that came out of the field wet. Uh, and it is drying over my wood stove. And as soon as Yvonne said over dried, I said, I gotta move that. So that's about how seed can be dried in the air. Seed doesn't wanna be dried above a certain temperature. Generally it's about a hundred degrees 
102, I think is actually the whatever that you wanna make sure that the actual seed itself doesn't reach above a certain temperature or it'll actually kill the seed or, or damage the parts internally. So there, every some seeds are even more tender. So you're looking at basically no more than 90 degrees. Uh, and you're also looking at an element of, there's a ratio where seed is good that it's stored, that's good that it's dry. And then there's a point where a seed is a living organism. So it actually needs moisture to maintain its metabolic uh, you know, life cycle in the seed. So this is where, um, what often happens with overdried seed is honestly, the seed comes in too wet. And that's actually how we over dry it because the seed is actually damp and actually not cured down. It's actually too fresh. And so that's actually where over drying can damage a dry seeded crop like a bean is that that softness actually allows the heat to penetrate more deeply into the seed and cook and potentially rupture cells. So you effectively are sort of slowly steaming the seed. That's why good drying is generally slow and consistent, not kind of like a hot spot drying. Um, and so do you think we could just over dye just using fans, beans, for example? Uh, fans are not going to over dry seed, that's for sure. No, generally just air movement itself at room temperature will never over dry anything. So that's not a concern. It's more when we try to flash seed uh, or kind of process them quickly or sort of salvage them uh, that we end up having problems. All right. Well, you've all been amazing. And I, I want to give a huge round to all of our presenters. Um, we really got our money's worth today. Thank you so much. And I also want to give a huge round to Steph, who has been behind the scenes solving all the problems and hurting all of us cats and um, really amazing two days. Uh, thank you, Steph, so much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for your thoughtful facilitation. Thank you all of you guys for sharing such amazing depth of information. This is like not the sexiest seed content um, and it's hard to get access to it with this level of detail um, so I'm really, I'm just thrilled that you've all been so generous. Thanks again to Marie-Claude, Perrin, Mel, um, and Yvonne and Matthew. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Fun. Take care, everybody.